Ventura here with Dr. Martin Timar from Austria. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about your presentation? Sure. Uh, my presentation is about um, how so-called gravitomagnetic fields can actually provide a solution um, for a Cooper pair mass anomaly. What does that mean? <laughs> um, superconductors. Um, uh, superconductor basically, um, I mean that's something that is um, um, that has no electric resistance. For instance, it's a very unique uh, state of matter, and um, superconductivity is made out of so-called Cooper pairs. So the electrons in a material they form pairs, and um, um, basically these pairs uh, is, is a new state of matter, and that that, that provides all these fancy features of superconductivity. Now, if um, how do you measure the mass of the Cooper pairs? Um, you can measure this with uh, one um, uh, effect uh, in physics uh, known the so-called London moment. If you rotate the superconductor, then the superconductor will generate a magnetic field. Um, the interesting thing is that this magnetic field is so different compared to the magnetic field that you generate uh, using um, um, standard coils uh, that, that, that we know from normal electromagnetism. Um, if you have a coil, uh, you have a wire, and you put in some current, then the magnetic field that we generate will depend on, uh, of course, the current that is flowing for the coil, um, and of course it's being influenced by the dimension of the coil. Uh, if you have a very large coil, then the field in the middle will be a little bit weaker than if you have a very small coil, sure, so you have the sure. field lines a little bit more dense. Now, if you have a superconductor, if you rotate the superconductor, things get completely different. <laughs> First of all, it does not depend on the size of your superconductor, the magnetic field that you generate. Yeah? Something which is, uh, which is so different from, from our world of normal matter. Um, and um, basically, this magnetic field that you generate depends on the so-called charge to mass ratio of the Cooper pairs and the angular velocity. Um, so if you precisely measure this magnetic field and you know the angular velocity, then you can calculate what's the charge of a mass ratio of the Cooper pairs. You know it's made out of two electrons, so the charge is clear, it's two charges, and so you can calculate the mass basically of this, of this Cooper pair. And um, uh, what you would assume uh, using normal physics and uh, also quantum theory is the fact that uh, the Cooper pair should have a mass which is just a little bit less than two times the electron mass because the electrons are forming a pair, so some of this energy is going into this pairing. Well, would this mean that the, the device itself, the superconductor, loses weight then? Um, no, 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 no. Um, energy is equal to mass. So if you have now, for example, particles forming a pair, then some of this energy basically from, from, from the electron is not going into this binding energy. It's very similar to, to nuclear energy, right? So mm, to this okay. nuclear binding energy and so on. And so you would assume uh, that uh, just the Cooper pairs, uh, if, you, if you have the mass, is just a little bit less um, than two times the electron mass. Um, now, if you do this measurement, um, um, then interesting enough, it turns out that the Cooper pairs are actually a little bit heavier than two times the electron mass. Oh, okay. And uh, that is really completely counterintuitive. <laughs> and it's, it's not only intuition, but um, it doesn't fit into our um, current understanding of physics at all. What do you think this is telling us about about uh, the Cooper pairs? I mean, what, how do you think there are any applications that might come out of this? Or no, let me continue the story. The thing is that um, uh, this Cooper, uh, this this London moment, is the first measurements were done in the 60s at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in NASA, and um, the most precise measurement up to date was done um, by Janet Tate in Stanford, actually. Um, well, she did her PhD on that topic, and this was a preparation activity for Gravity Probe B. Yeah, so this is, um, this is this mission which is right now trying to measure the so-called gravitomagnetic field produced by the Earth. And uh, so she did this precision measurement and she came to the conclusion that there is somehow a mismatch between our current theoretical understanding. Very small, very tiny mismatch. Mm, okay. And this was then discussed over 15 years in literature without any apparent solution. So, so, so many people thought about additional correction factors, so on and so forth. But, um, but uh, basically, the conclusion you can read this in Physical Review Letters. Conclusion is that the mismatch between theory and experiment is is totally unclear for the moment. And uh, we offered a solution 2003, saying that 
let's assume that quantum theory is indeed correct, <laughs> so that the Cooper pair mass is indeed a little bit less than two times the electron mass, then there must be an additional field present which is somehow hiding this fact <laughs> if you only measure the magnetic field. Yeah? So there is a, a so-called gravitomagnetic field involved in this mm, okay. uh, rotating superconductor which is of course also very small so that nobody basically detected it up to now but uh, if you do the computation so if you you have a measurement of this delta mass right uh, and you know what quantum theory actually expects so you can calculate the field strength and the field strength is about 20 orders of magnitude higher than you would expect uh, using uh, general relativity theory so so that can open as a venue to explore this field yeah Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, you know, I mean, uh, like Dr. Ningley and then Eugene Ponkloff and, and several others have suggested that superconductors could be used to modify gravitational force, gravitational fields, something like that. Do you think that might be a possibility in the future then? Um, the thing is that uh, this um, so-called gravitomagnetic field, um, well, is, is of course different uh, to, to the experiments, uh, especially, for example, claimed by, by Eugene Podgetnov, because he was saying that he observed um, a, a kind of gravitational shielding effect. Yeah? So I'm, I'm not at all talking about the kind of a gravitational shielding effect. Um, uh, this is just if you, for example, um, if you take an electron and you move your electron, then around this moving electron you will create a so-called magnetic field. That's normally electromagnetism. If you have a Cooper pair <laughs> and you're moving this Cooper pair, you're generating a so-called gravitomagnetic field around it. Um, so a kind of a gravitational uh, aspect, um, a field which is related to general relativity theory, um, but, uh, but very much in the line of, of Einstein's uh, field theory. So, so there's no new physics or whatever involved. It's just that the coupling between the field that is generated by the Cooper pair, or for example by a single electron, appears, if you follow at least this experiment um, on the Cooper pair mass measurement, it's one of the possible explanations could be different. Yeah? Uh, what Ning Li also was doing uh, was um, that she was also playing with gravitomagnetic fields uh, in superconductors, but um, but in a very different way. So she was um, she was investigating um, if you have all these many Cooper pairs um, basically in the lattice of the superconductor, that they they all add up to a giant uh, gravitomagnetic field. Um, that's 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 not the case, and actually, also in her calculations, uh, there were several mistakes were found, and uh, uh, well, all these experiments, also from Podgetnov, unfortunately, were never really replicated. I mean, they were re replicated um, um, with a negative result up to now. So it's always very difficult, actually, to uh, <laughs> the replication aspect in yeah, experimental yeah. physics. That's that's a very Oh, you know, al although Tony Robertson from NASA had, had said that part of the, the replication failure may have been they weren't able to rotate it up to the 5,000 RPM that Punk Lednoff had indicated, uh, I, I guess they, there were some concerns about the device spontaneously disintegrating at those high speeds. So, so it, it's possible that, well, m maybe not very likely, but I guess it is possible that maybe the rotation speed just wasn't high enough. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, for example, also Bot Gatenov kept saying that... Uh, uh, you have a 10 diameter disc uh, in the replication effort and he used a 15 diameter disc. <laughs> the thing is the superconductivity, as I just said, size doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the physical size of an object doesn't matter. And also, for example, if you look at, at again, the gravitational aspects, yeah? also this gravitomagnetic field, as I just explained, this long moment, that's all proportional to the angular velocity. Sure. There is no threshold or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I mean, would be good to ask a little bit about about um, just your thoughts on the Stafe conference that's coming up. Are you looking forward to any pr papers in particular from any of the presenters or anything like that? Sure. I mean, the Stafe conference. Um, what well, is a very good opportunity to exchange on um, maybe not so conventional uh, topics like like break for propulsion, this kind of things. Um, they're also from the so-called John Propulsion Conference. There are also sessions on very advanced propulsion. Um, and, and the STAFE Conference is a very interesting counterpart on that. So Yeah. The, the thing that attracts me to it is you have this merger of, I, I guess, science and then the, the industry interests and the government interests. And it seems like they're really fostering something that's larger than any one of those interests by itself could be. 
So it's kind of a coming together, I guess. And I think that's something our community definitely needs more of. Yeah, you know, of course, I mean, science is not done basically alone by somebody, uh, you know, hiding at home. Um, that was the case uh, 100 years ago, but nowadays science is really advanced uh, with people coming together, talking together, exchanging their ideas. Um, for example, for myself, um, I always need to talk about my ideas with other people, and at the moment, I'm explaining yeah, no, it's a sounding it. board, though. Um, you need a sounding board to be able to I realize, I realize the weak points in our theoretical arguments, so, yeah. No, it's, it's awesome. Well, and, and uh, you know, one of the ideas that we'd had in the past was doing some kind of a round table to try and get, you know, people like yourself with the, the, the discipline to be able to do the math and then the ideas that they can share with others, kind of put them in a room and, and have them see, you know, what are the key issues, what are the things that we can work on in the 21st century, and then hopefully build kind of a road map. I think Mark Millis might have attempted some of this in the past, but it would hopefully continue his legacy. So, yeah. so still, of course, we don't have this final kind of unified field theory that could be string theory, that could be variance of string theory. Um, other approaches, yeah, that are not out there yet. Uh, but still, um, I mean, for example, it's fascinating, you know. It was found out also recently doing experiments that um, a neutron, you know, is falling down in steps. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. Quantum, qu it's quantized quantum gravity, if I remember right. They were describing Yeah, so, so, so we start of kind of discover, um, we, we are about to discover the first kind of quantum gravity effect. They're of course extremely small, yeah? but this, that will add a lot in our understanding. Yeah, the, the other one that I've been hearing a lot about recently is loop gravity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been around for a while, right? It's just for some reason making the headlines again. So. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting. You no, know. Loop gravity is is, um, is also kind of string theory. Right? That's that's what I'm saying. It can be one variant of string theory. Um, I mean, for example, um, also gravity pro b. We will have very precise measurement of the so-called gravitomagnetic field of the Earth. We need, for example, um, that's where space technology actually comes in. We need a lot of space technology to find out new aspects of gravity, the Pioneer anomaly. And in Europe, we are proposing to to do a mission, just investigate um, this feature. Um, another thing is you know, to, to measure the fabric of space-time um, uh, with atomic clocks, very precise atomic clocks. Um, I mean, doing fundamental physics in space where you have large dimensions, uh, um, you need a different laboratory you know, to yeah. investigate gravity. Well, it definitely gives you, it, it will move some of the variables that you have here on Earth. But, you know, it also adds in others, right? I mean, the solar wind is more pronounced. So, you know, little things like particles streaming by might... You need very precise thrusts, actually, to, to, to counterbalance all these external influences, you know? Yeah. We make this thrust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. are, are you working for the ESA now, then, or...? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, we have... Oh, course. okay. I, I, I didn't... I wasn't sure what you were doing for the job situations. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm head of the space propulsion department um, at Cyberstuff of Research, so this is the largest non-university research organization in Austria. Oh, okay. And our main focus is the development of a so-called field emission thruster, field thruster, which, which is this enabling technology that can um, counterbalance all these external forces in space. You can really achieve ultra-precise, drag-free environments to investigate gravitational facts. Mm. For example, for LISA, to measure gravitational waves. Uh, these thrusters are baselined to, to actually enable LISA. Yeah. Now, speaking of gravitational waves, there's been some debate. One of the things, Gary Stevenson and I have talked about this a few times, um, some of the general controversy about the high-frequency gravitational waves, the, the actual output that people might be expecting from those. I mean, isn't one of the challenges that, that uh, you know, the, the way that they're presumed work the high frequencies may produce a scaling on an order of magnitude, but it may not. Nobody's entirely sure. And that was, he mentioned something to that effect. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that kind of controversy or not. Uh, I'm not so much uh, into this kind of controversy. I mean, from my understanding, is I mean, gravitational waves, that's general relativity theory. Huh? Uh, we are usually looking at this low frequency band because that's how we, how we think we can observe the universe. Huh? black holes, supernovas, and so on. It's a new aspect to probably also investigate high-frequency gravitational waves, that's fine, but, um, but um, 
this is all general relativity theory. So there is, uh, I expect this effect to be quite small actually. And also, yeah. if you look at uh, what these people came, what they need, it's a. It's a yeah, it is interesting. Sometimes the harder you look, the more, I don't know, I guess the word vaporware comes to mind sometimes, you know. Hopefully this is something more than that, but it is difficult, you know, it's like pull up different rocks, look underneath, there's nothing there, so. So, I don't know. Interesting stuff. Was so the ESA is doing gravity measurements then, huh? For, for, is, no, is LISA, is that ESA specific or is that? No, LISA is a giant NASA ESA project, you know. So, so that's a joint mission, yeah. But, oh, okay. But um, so, for example, ESA is also on the drawing board in future possible future missions. The number of missions to investigate fundamental physics in space on the drawing board, at least. And uh, yeah. So same. I mean, NASA has for sure similar uh, similar missions on the drawing board. But um, there will be many breakthroughs. So for this ultra-precise drag-free environment to do really very precise measurements of the coolant principle. For example, we don't know how charged antimatter is forming. Yeah? You can do experiments in space looking for sedimentation processes between antimatter and matter. Um, you know, probably find negative mass or whatever. Yeah, there's some interesting work. You know, I, I heard about antimatter molecules being made. Apparently they're able to put, have you heard about that? Someone was able I heard to about antimatter um, Atoms being made, yeah, which atoms. is already a huge fault. step. Molecules, I have My fault, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, an anti-hydrogen atom, actually. Yeah, interesting. They put a normal particle into the same atom with an antiparticle. Yeah. So, and it, I guess it remains stable for a while. Do you know what's interesting thing with antimatter? Antimatter is traveling back in time. Oh, uh, for real? Yeah. Back in time. I mean, that's, that's, that's our understanding, looking from quantum theory, you know? So this is a state of matter which is traveling back in time. Isn't it interesting? Yeah, it is. But then the <laughs> kinetic properties that has still are forward time, right? Um, I mean, the kinetic properties. No, it's just. Um, I mean, that would be. The we way. we can hardly do experiments with antimatter because um, um, we need to trap them. Huh? The so-called panning trap. Now we have now this kind of technology emerging. Thank you.